week. For more information on the nominees in all categories, visit wgaeast.org slash awards. Thanks to Variety and Final Draft for co-hosting this event with us once again. We are delighted to have a stellar group of documentarians here with us tonight, and I want to thank them for being here. Our moderator, Writers Guild of America East President and writer of more information on the nominees in all categories, visit Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks to Variety and Final Draft. We are our moderator, Writers Guild of America East president and writer of more than 150 documentaries. Michael Winship will introduce the panelists in a moment. We will have two consecutive conversations this evening. The first with our theatrical documentary nominees, followed by our TV streaming nominees. Michael has lots of questions for both groups, but you may use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to pose questions at any time. And you can pose them in the chat if you are watching this on Variety's platform, and we will get them to Michael. Um, post those questions at any time, and he'll read them out at the end of each conversation. Please use the Q&A function if you're on the Zoom, not the chat function, um, if you're going to pose questions. Now, please join me in wel welcoming Michael Winship and the writers for Outstanding Documentary Screenplay. Well, welcome to everybody. We're really excited to have all of you here, all of our, our uh panelists and everyone in our audience and uh, i'm hearing the echo again okay i think we may be traveling in time um anyway welcome to all of you and thank you all for being here that i that somebody came up with that 150 number last year in terms of documentaries that i've written which i found truly alarming and uh, and I and I hasten to add that not all of them were necessarily very good, uh, but the ones that are represented tonight by our writers are certainly really quality work and really excellent, and, and we're excited to have everybody here. I also just want to thank uh, Dana, who you just saw, Dana Weissman, uh, and Nancy Hathorn, and Molly Beer, uh, for helping putting these to put these panels together in conjunction with the awards. These, these panels are just one of the many great events they create for the Writers Guild. They do a, a terrific job. So uh, as Dana said, I'm gonna chat with our panelists, uh, uh, encourage them to talk among themselves also. Uh, and after a while, we'll be taking your questions too. So I'd like to welcome our first group of nominees. And I'm not gonna go through the bios of everybody because you can look them up and Trust me that they are all people with great experience and, and skill and storytelling. Um, this first group, Pax Wasserman, who's nominated for Becoming Cousteau, National Geographic Film. Uh, Mark Schaefer, who's nominated for Exposing Moybridge, uh, Inside Out Media. Um, Suzanne Jokai, who is nominated for what I believe is her first full-length documentary, like a Rolling Stone, The Life and Times of Ben Fong Torres for Studio LA TV. So welcome and congratulations on your nominations. All well deserved. Um, oh, just, just because not everyone's had a chance to see the film yet and some of the films haven't gone into wide release, I'd like each of you to uh, briefly describe what your documentary is about or who your documentary is about and what motivated you and your colleagues to tell these particular stories. And I think we'll begin with Suzanne. Suzanne, did you hear me? Okay, uh, let's go to Pax. Yeah, I'm assuming um, you can hear me. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. What what you and I think we'll what's going on. And I think we'll begin with Suzanne. Hi. Oh, <laughs> so, Suzanne, uh, can you hear me? I, I can yeah. hear you. I, I got a bit of an echo. So yeah, me too. 
could you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, okay. can, can you hang on just a second? Hey, uh, Molly and okay. Nancy, can we, uh, yes. can we figure out what the problem is here? Yes. Somebody has a second device, like earphones. Hmm. Okay. Are we okay now? I have earphones on, but does that cause an echo? I mean, I do too, but it's never been a problem before. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. What I was, what I started off by asking was, um, you know, this whole idea of uh, to ask each of you to briefly describe what your documentary is about and who it's about and what motivated you and your production colleagues to tell this story. So I was going to start with. Uh, Suzanne, and I'm, I'm right in assuming this is your first documentary, right? Your full length. Go ahead. Hi, can, can everyone hear me? I still hear an echo. Yeah, me too. Can everyone hear this echo? You're hearing an echo. Okay, so should we? No, no, no more echo. Okay. Hi, I'm Suzanne Joe Kai. This is my. Can everyone hear me? I still hear an echo. Oh, now I'm hearing an echo again. Nancy, Molly. I think that I think that might be Suzanne has a, a phone or something lost. It, unfortunately, it's still only happening. Hi, I'm Suzanne. Hi, I'm Suzanne. Sometimes when you leave and come back in, all things are corrected. Do you want to try that? Sorry, everybody. Mm. Um, okay, I'm gonna chat to Suzanne. Let's continue the conversation um, with, elsewhere. <laughs> okay, so Pax, let's go back to you Yeah. about your about the inspiration for your film, what it's about and, and, and your motivation, et cetera. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I'm the co-writer of Becoming Cousteau which is about Jacques Cousteau. And mm -hmm. it's really about his transformation from being an adventurer and many things, an inventor and somewhat reckless and even involvement in oil expo exploitation of the oceans to um, the conservationists and the TV star, movie star that we knew later on, the statesman that we knew later on. Uh, you are, you are uh, blessed or maybe cursed with uh, an incredible amount of archival material because he, he basically filmed everything. Um, how did you manage to, to get through it all and sort through what you wanted to do in terms of your storytelling? Well, we started by looking for places where there was a lot of material that so we could feel like first person with him as much as possible through the telling his story. So it was kind of like we had the scripts, this idea of the scope of what we wanted to cover and then what, what footage we had. And it was kind of a dialogue between those two things to make sure that the audience could live in his uh, enthusiasm and live in those curious moments and experience things firsthand. You know, we used all archival interviews. We did a, maybe four or five new interviews, but very few. So it was all really archivally told. Um, throughout it, but it was an enormous amount of material. There was things, short films he had made that weren't very well known. There were outtakes from films that we had. So we had some play with going from the outtake to what was in the final film and things like that, um, as well as he had done, he'd been interviewed a, a million times or between, you know, um, things that he did that were, you know, on TV, like the Dick Cabot show. He was always like the third guest on the Dick Cabot show because he was this fun old guy. So there was some a certain kind of a, a persona that was there. Then there was somebody also, when he was interviewed um, in French, um, lots of different series that we got much more depth from. Um, and then there's also the writings. He was a very poetic person. So we drew on those writings and that was like, in the beginning we wanted to tell the film 
we weren't going to use any narration. Um, we ended up having uh, an actor read the narration later on, but uh, there was so much beautiful stuff that only existed in the written word. Um, and he was a, had a very poetic soul. Um, so we wanted to make sure that came across as well. I, I was fascinated by the fact that, that some of this material was, was were things that he actually filmed uh, during World War II. And I was wondering how he managed to, to, to pull that off with a German occupation. There was so much I mean, he was, he was allowed to go about his life um, a little bit. He, he also, he had a- I was, I was fascinated by the fact that, that some of this material was, was were things that he actually filmed uh, during World War II. Was... Sorry, the echo came back. So I just wanted yeah. to see. Um, yeah, he was filming. He wasn't filming a ton during World War II. Mm -hmm. He was able to film some stuff, but we got some really beautiful stuff. Um, and he, you know, they were always, they were invented. They didn't really know what they were doing. So it was really about this drive to go deeper, to stay under the water mm -hmm. longer. So they had to invent mm -hmm. things to do that. So um, it wasn't that he set out to become an inventor of scuba or an inventor of um, some of the first underwater cameras, but in order to pursue their hobby, they had to um, for that. So he did, he was able to film quite a bit of really interesting stuff. So was that the biggest challenge in the sense of just, uh, just this vast tidal wave of material you had to work from or were there other yeah, things? Yeah, and also the well? scope of how much of his life we should tell. I mean, in the beginning mm -hmm. it was, you know, we didn't really want to do like a birth. It's not quite birth, it's death. But in order to tell the story of his transformation, there had to be these three acts to his life. Um, and to see him be all these different people and be the savvy businessman in one regard. And then other times he's this, the rousing guy that, you know, you would have seen like in the Wes Anderson film. It's kind of fun, mm -hmm. deckhand sort of guy. Right. And, um, and other times, again, he was the statesman. So it was really important for us to show the scope of his life in that way, I think. So that was always the, that I think that was probably the primary challenge was how to narrow it down. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in addition to that, it was, um, you know, hewing to the places where we had the best material and where we could live the longest. And there was a whole bunch of um, really sort of science fiction things that he was involved in um, where he really saw like, they, they as um, oceanauts, he called them. So he was sort of jealous in a way of like the astronauts going, and the attention they were getting, he was like, hey, we're doing the same thing, but we're going, we're going down instead of going up. Um, and there was a sort of a, almost like a mixture of a James Bond space race vibe. And even in the aesthetic of the things they designed that looked like spaceships um, that they're all really into. And it was a very, you know, he was attracted, he didn't pay the crew a lot. So there was attracted a certain kind of person that was attracted to this mm -hmm. adventure and this mm -hmm. you know, um, sort of prototypical male life yeah. right so um suzanne tell us a little bit about your film about ben fong torres is good i hope our problems are cleared up with the audio uh we're not hearing you okay I there you go. okay can you hear me and no reverberation thank so you far. <laughs> Uh, the film, I've known Ben for many, many years for both uh, uh, journalists, actually. Uh, I was a, a television, television reporter at the NBC station in San Francisco, and he, of course, was at Rolling Stone magazine and also working in television and radio. So at that time, they were like, maybe you can count on my finger, not even less than five Asian Americans in the whole, um, all of America. So we, we met and um, years later, I had actually moved to from San Francisco. I'm native born San Francisco, uh, from San Francisco uh, to Southern California. And he was coming down and said, um, hey, do you want to meet? I'm going to meet with Q. And it turned out Q was the Quincy Jones. And of course, I, you know, we met and over dinner, I said, we, there, you're in everybody's uh, documentary, rock and, uh, rock and roll documentary, but why isn't there one about you? And he said, so why don't you just do one? So that began that journey. And I thought this will be really fun. And it's very entertaining. And it still is. It's really actually funny and very entertaining. Um, but of course, there's some sad parts, you know, uh, very reflective parts. But um, it, it was a journey. And when I started to do the deep dive that all journalists do, 
I then started to record and understand from the insiders at Rolling Stone magazine with the rock stars in the community, friends and family. And then I came back with a completely different story, which is not in any books and not in any films. So yeah. then what started off to be, you know, a nice normal film and a normal schedule became a mission of mine. And the mission was I have to get this and I have to get this right. And Ben's story is missing in our American history. And for what he's done, um, it needs to be in American history. So, so then I went through all of this and then I discovered, you know, Annie Leibovitz was 20 when she started at Rolling Stone and she photographed most of uh, Ben's cover stories over the 10 years. You know, they started in this tiny, tiny little, uh, it's above a printing press in San Francisco in the industrial district. And there was barely room for three desks. It was, it was mm -hmm. rent free. And Ben was one of the first uh, to uh, help the startup basically uh, within the first uh, four or five months of its publication. So then you've got Annie Leibovitz who's contributing uh, amazing, amazing photographs from her private collection to our film. Uh, and we have a lot of exclusives. And then Ben opens up his private archives, which most have never been made public ever in the world. And they are the amazing, you know, conversations from, from the 60s and the 70s and even, you know, current, but especially then, and you can see, you can feel the, the emotional tones of the Carlos Santanas of the world and, and you know, the Elton Johns of the world and all of that. So, so um, that's how that started. It was, it's been quite a journey. And then plus Ben lived this double life in, in, a, in a good way, very inspiring way, because he didn't tell Rolling Stone what he was doing at night. He was working pro bono. Uh, at a little tiny little Chinatown, San Francisco startup, also um, was beginning to write in English. Uh, 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 it was a newspaper, and uh, so uh, he 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 didn't you know kind of kept those cultural lives separate, and that actually led to um, Ben being beaten up, and it just it gets really really dramatic and very sad. You know, this is when young people in the '60s they believed in civil rights. They believed in telling the truth, you know, uh, they were fighting the war in Vietnam and all that. So, so the crazy thing about this film is it is a deep dive into that era, but it also is very, very contemporary to today. It's, it's almost like a mirror of what is in a way going on today, all the, all the racism and all of that that we're facing today. I mean, they're killing people that look like me, that, you know, like the older generation in the streets. You know, it, it's, it's awful. And in the early part of our film, we're, we're showing Ben typing. And then the audience is starting to realize that he's actually typing about the racism going on today, you know, in, 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 right. in, in this year. So, so it's taken you about 10 years to make this film. 12 years. Right? 12 years. OK. <laughs> so, Mark, uh, exposing Moybridge, uh, what and who is it about and how long has it taken you to to make it become a reality? I thought I was working on it for a long time, nine years or so. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, it's it's hard as these timelines are funny if you make your own film because 80% of the timeline is begging for money. So no, right. I wasn't watching. I wasn't making a movie for nine years. I was begging for money for seven years. And then I made a movie for two years. Uh, it's about Edward Mybridge, who uh, is uh, best known for taking the first photographs in the 19th century of an object moving faster than the human eye can see, which are were galloping horses. And they're all over the internet now. He's all over the internet. So he sort of lives in the American subconscious. Uh, but most people don't know his name. When I talk to people or I would mention that I'm making a movie about a guy named Mybridge, they all sort of blank, they, who's that? And I didn't know who he was when I started. I, I uh, was making a film about San Francisco, early San Francisco, I needed photographs. And uh, an archivist started bringing me photographs and I, I was really drawn to some of them. They were really kind of haunting and uh, very kind of artfully framed. People were often looking away from the camera to a sort of horizon. It, it had a very dreamy quality and they were always by the same guy with the funny name. And so I, you know, it's the age of Google. So I punched his name into Google and realized immediately that he was a really major figure and that I didn't know him and a lot of other people didn't know who he was and he had a whole life as a uh, landscape photographer before a very prominent landscape photographer in the west 
before he broke the speed barrier in, in photography. When he broke the speed barrier of photography, he uh, invented a machine to give lectures about motion because he fancied himself sort of like a scientist, although he was a really bad scientist. Um, he was more an artist and he would put these lectures on and he would project these motion like GIF like animations. And these mm -hmm. were uh, the very first uh, movies made from live action photography. So he's often called the father of cinema, which is a, mm -hmm. a little bit of an exaggeration or a, a misstatement, but it's sort of in the neighborhood of being correct. It's interesting to hear the other two filmmakers talk about their movies because I sort of fit in between them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They're, they're, we're all, we all three of us made a movie about uh, a media maker. Right. Right. And uh, you two made uh, very modern figures, right? And uh, who, in a way, Ben Fong Torres, I mean, he wasn't a public figure. His, uh, new, his magazine was very well known. And anybody who knows Rolling Stone knows that name. I certainly do. But he wasn't a public figure like Jacques Cousteau, right? Jacques, I'm old enough to grow up and have seen Jacques Cousteau on television. Sure. sort of fantasize about him and all. Um, so he was a very big, well-known figure. And I think Mybridge sort of fits in the sort of limbo middle ground between being, on the one hand, this unknown that nobody really knows who he is. And on the other hand, he, I mean, he's a cultural revolutionary. He mm -hmm. changed our world. He, not many yeah. people can say that they changed the world and, and he truly did. And my my first to, exposure, uh, my, my first exposure to Mybridge was an episode of Death Valley Days. You remember I don't know that what that is. Show? It was an anthology, Western anthology show <laughs> on TV for years. And they did an episode about him and Stanford White, a dramatic episode. Or, or Leland and, Stanford, actually. Uh, yeah, Leland exactly. Stanford, sorry. Yeah. And, then I, and, and then I wrote a film about Thomas Aikens. And of course, he had a... Oh, okay. You wrote, you did that. Yeah, sure. Relationship, okay. with, relationship with him. But you also, I mean, I, I, I salute your bravery in that you, you managed to get funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is a process and a half uh, that yeah. documentary filmmakers, um, especially people making films about historical figures, have to endure. So... Um, Tell people what that's like, because it's, it's... Well, um, you know, it's better than the alternative of no money, <laughs> uh, because then you can't make a movie if you're not lucky enough to be, you know, swimming in your own personal fortune. Uh, and I'm not uh, swimming in my own personal fortune. So you got to find your money somewhere. And it's not pleasant no matter where you look. I don't have a... I didn't really know, have any special sort of formula for how to do it. And when I sort of settled in on my bridge, I, I thought, well... Two things I thought, oh, this is an amazing story because his story goes well beyond what I described. He's this quirky character mm. and his he lives a melodramatic life. It's it's really Gary Oldman wrote a screenplay he wanted to make into a film about Mybridge. He wasn't able so far to get the money he wants to do it. So um, but that gives you an idea of the kind of drama that's in it. Mm. And his photography is uh and, and, and the more you dig into his photography, it's very layered. And, and I like to say he's not, it's like a lot of historical movies treat their figures, if they're this far back, really as kind of time capsules. There are these little things that happen in another time that are interesting to know about and we learn about that person. And certainly my, our film does that, but my bridge, I like to say, is the beginning of now, right. not then. And, and so his, his work really invents and, and speaks very, very much to what we are going through now in our media age. And so it felt like a good uh, subject for the NEH. So mm -hmm. uh, it was really very difficult for my other filmmakers. You know, it's not for the faint of heart, but it exists. Mm -hmm. I got rejected right. twice for the uh, development grant. And just kept going, kept putting it back and asking it for it again. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the, they finally said yes to that. And the production grant was pretty close to 200 pages long. Wow. And, um, you know, and when you're doing that, as, as we all know, as filmmakers, uh, there's this really, it's very frustrating because, you know, you want to make your film. You don't want to write a PhD. You know, I'm not in graduate school. I don't want to perform for you. I don't want to prove to you that I know what I'm, that this will be a good film but you just have to. And the, mm -hmm. the silver lining of it 
is, you know, that process forces you to really, really, really think a lot about your subject mm -hmm. and refine your thinking and refine your storytelling and think about, you know, what's important about this guy mm -hmm. and, and how to, how to convey it. Now you have to, for the NEH, the other thing is it's a very academic grant. So you have to really push the sort of academic side. Right. Right. And some of it, it requires unwinding from that when you get back into trying to tell a, a story or make a film, because, you know, you don't really want to make a film for graduate school. You want to make a film for the general public. And you have to sort of crawl back out of that very kind of intellectual space and make it interesting and narrative again, mm -hmm. but hopefully mm -hmm. improved and sort of made more, you have more gravitas because of all that hard work you've done. Can, uh, it certainly was my certainly right. Was my case, yeah. it, it, it's it's a it's a very grueling process, uh, and you as you mm -hmm. said, you've got panels of academics and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, three of you, though, I think I would love. Uh, I think for a lot of the people who aren't all that familiar with this mm -hmm. form of screenwriting, if if you all could talk a little bit about why it's different from feature films or episodic TV, what's different about it, and. Uh, how you go about that. I think, you know, part of it is that brevity is, is key. Um, but so is the selection of sound bites from interviews and archival materials and, and even the music. So um, I'd love to hear you all talk about that. Who wants That's to start? Jump ball. <laughs> okay, I'll start. <laughs> I just finished, but I'll try and be brief. So, you know, I've done a lot of current events documentaries that's mm -hmm. my primary sort of work right. aside from this. And, you know, doing this kind of work, historical documentary is very different. The story sort of exists already. You know, it's not <laughs> uncovered or discovered or dug out. Um, and so there's more space to sort of focus on craft, maybe in that respect, and not just collection or the, the act of journalism, which, of course, has its own demands in terms of telling the story well, but so much appropriately is focused on, on getting the story. And, and off in this case, there's like 12 books written about them. Now I found mm -hmm. out new stuff, but that, that changes the dynamic. Um, for me, I felt like music was gonna be essential because it was a bunch of still photographs uh, that he made that existed before the time of moving footage. I didn't have a, a, you know bucketfuls of, of wonderful, moving images, stock footage, like the, the Cousteau case. Um, I, but you know, not all films are made the same, you know, filmmakers have voices and mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I wanted my sit, I had knew I was stuck. I, I was ambivalent about sit down interviews, but I kind of knew I needed to do that. And, um, but I wanted my sit down interview subjects to feel like real people, even though they were scholars, even though they weren't talking from the first person because he's been dead for 120 years. Um, I wanted to feel their humanity and, and, and interview them to try to pull that out of them. And then in the edit room, let my editor, Elizabeth Haviland James, um, sort of have fun with finding moments that would normally be cut out for efficiency reasons. You know, let it go, let, let, let her laugh. You know, let her say that sort of aside that doesn't make any sense really, or is even a little bit weird, you know, because I get a feeling for her. Um, but anyway, that, that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. Suzanne Pax. I'll go. Um, yeah, I remember being struck when I first started working in documentary about, you know, we would, I worked on this film called Devil's Playground. We jam packed all this information about the Amish in there and, you know, it just it just weighted down the story that we were trying to tell and mm -hmm. realizing that the amount of information you can communicate in a documentary is about the same as a somewhat concise like magazine article or something like that, if you want it to feel like an experience. So I think, you know, for this film, that was, again, really big for us to, you know, the director's Liz Garbus, um, to, to be with him and feel an experience and have enough room to follow, you know, a lot of tragedy in his life to follow a tragedy um, when it, and just give some space to, for emotion to take, to take flight. So I think it was also, the process was a lot of just chasing inspiration. We should do it this way, we should do it that way. There was definitely also kind of a happy accident in that uh, COVID meant that we, there were the interviews that we had planned to do that were probably gonna be 
visual interviews became just some phone interviews and it made us lean even further into the archival and forced us to root the whole film in that. Um, so I'm actually quite happy about that. Um, I like those restrictions. You know, it's almost like, mm -hmm. and like a dogma film for us or something like that. Right. Point. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, yeah, that was, that's probably it. I'll leave it with Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne, anything you want to add there? Yes, uh, for me, it was, uh, it was, it was really a process. I, I think some people say uh, when you're doing a documentary, you're actually writing it two or three different times because you're writing it. Uh, the good news for me, at least, is uh, when I finally settled in with all the revelations and all the insider information, uh, I actually laid down, you know, kind of the story arc. And then, then you know, I, I brought in uh, uh, great editors, you know, Doug Blush, he's, you know, Academy member, 20 Feet from Stardom. Uh, and he actually has been with me since 2014 as an advisor for our film. So, and of course, Frida Lee Mock, Oscar winner, incredible. So collectively, we were reviewing the film from an emotional standpoint, from story arc, from everything, and particularly music, because Ben had given me this treasure trove of mostly never heard before in the world uh, conversations with, with these great artists. So we're weaving in the uh, the storyline into with with the music with the musicians in their their archives. So I just wanted to end there that it was um, kind of an organic kind of uh, uh, pathway to finish the film, you know, mm -hmm. with with the uh, the final. Well, um, Pax mentioned the the impact of the pandemic on the process of making the film. How was it for? For the two of you, what kind of impact did it have, if any? Uh, for me, it was a really just a stroke of luck because I wanted to have um, uh, uh, a major international uh, rock star, you know, to close the film with Ben, you know, backstage or somewhere. And it actually happened, and it happened very quickly. And then when it did happen. Um, uh, within of like a week or two, then started the announcements about the pandemic. Yeah. So we were just very, very fortunate. That became our, our final shoot. We should, After, we should say it's Elton John, by the way. There's yes, your, it's the Elton big John. Reveal. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And that little text, it, it, I got a back yes, like in 24 hours. Like it was a shock. It was like amazing. It was just, mm -hmm. uh, turns out, you know, Elton has a great, um, love and respect for Ben and you know all of that from uh was it just came, the universe came together perfectly Mark how about you uh the pandemic uh, question yeah. yeah the pandemic got in the way um I was uh still in production when it hit and um so uh suddenly I couldn't do some things I had planned to do um the interview with Gary Oldman had to be delayed um, and some, the final scene in the film, which takes place, uh, in London, outside London had to be delayed. Um, so that was an economic stress for sure. Cause you're oh, already sure. trying to get more done than you have money for. And suddenly you're looking at, you know, a timeline that's a year longer or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, creatively, I couldn't get into certain museums that I was going to shoot his objects and uh, they were shut down. They, nobody was going in. That was uh, off. And, and I, I had to wait a long time to get some images and some images I never got. And, you know, my experience has been that, you know, sometimes when doors are closed, the process of finding an open one yields something even better than you ho hoped for in the original impulse. And so when, so I ended up finding I, I great animators and finding ways to sort of convey the visually what I was going to show you. Um, and so it's not as uh, accurate, I guess you would say. I mean, you're not looking at the actual object, you're looking at an animation, but uh, mm -hmm. in some ways probably more uh, entertaining. But no, it, 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 was, uh, it was a bummer. Mm. Still is, you know, ooh, pandemic. I did notice there was one uh, cute question about the editor. I did want to say I mentioned our editors, Elizabeth Hamill yes. and James, and whether editors were writers too. And in my experience in documentary, yes, editors do, uh, to greater or lesser degree, obviously, yeah. have a big hand in the shaping of a film. 
yeah. uh, through their choices. Uh, and certainly Elizabeth was very much involved in helping refine. Right. Well, it goes to my, it goes to the point I was, I was trying to make earlier, which is that writing a documentary isn't simply about, about putting words to, to pictures, but it's also about the choice of what your interview subjects say. It's also yeah. about, you said the music, it's also about the, the, the sound bites and, and the archival material. It's all of that to me is, is writing, you know? Yeah, sure. And there was a period uh, with the Writers Guild Awards when when we were doing document initially doing documentary awards and stuff that there was a sticking point about whether or not a, you know something that was not necessarily with narration was actually a script and uh, our argument was that it absolutely was because when you're choosing to position this piece here and that piece there you're actually as you were saying about your editor you're writing yeah we don't have a narrator we didn't want one. Mm -hmm. I didn't want one. Mm -hmm. uh, and boy, is that thing, there's like 75 scripts, you know, that, mm -hmm. that were constructed to put this thing together, you know? Right. If there were no script, there'd be no film. <laughs> it's yeah. a black screen and no sound. <laughs> now, you said, Pax, that you had an actor who uh, you used to, to read, even though there was a lot of yeah. Fusto on camera. Yeah, there was about, um, about a dozen instances where there mm -hmm. were just things that were really personal moments that mm -hmm. we wanted to include in there. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, we started out with, we were working through what he said in, these, in different interviews and you know, all kinds of things like that. And there was just like this other guiding lights document that we sort of put away. This is stuff he wrote somewhere. Let's find the thing that's closest to that because we want to use his voice because it's supposed to be him narrating his own life. Mm -hmm. At the end, there were just there were things that were so special in there, um, and so personal and intimate that we felt like you know even just things about the, the feeling of um, solitude that he got under the water, and and also the nature of how um, he uh, saw going underwater as an escape from the world. It, was, it could be an escape from mm -hmm. you know family, uh, as a father, responsibilities as a husband, or as uh, or from the world that like we'd all like to escape from once in a while and it, the solitude that came from that. So things like that, that we wanted to have in there. So there was a, probably about a dozen or so, maybe maybe less that we had Vincent Cassell, who was a oh, terrific great. actor, who doesn't sound like him, but actually mm -hmm. quantifies. I mean, he was the one we wanted from the beginning and became the only name. And we almost, it was one of these things where we gave up and then it happened. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was great. Um, Suzanne, I not having seen your film yet, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, do you do you have a narration? Do you or or is it without? I uh, don't think we have narration because Ben so he's he's a very serious professional, of course, mm -hmm. but he's also very very funny. So we were recording some of the festival screenings, the live ones, and people are actually laughing throughout. So we didn't have a a, a narrator at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do I do want to just mention one thing. Uh, over the course of review, because you know, as a journalist, we we always like to confirm a lot of things. That's why I did like so many shoots. You know, um, Steve Padilla, Henry Fairman at the LA Times, they would actually help me write grant applications <laughs> because I wanted to make sure my my words were accurate. Because you know, in television as broadcaster, we talk more conversationally. So mm -hmm. in the inside of that, they said, Suzanne, you're film, because I'm used to having many, many editors in my newsroom at, when I was in television. He says, no, Ben was one of one. So that means he helped shape American culture, period. So all of a sudden the bar rose completely and, you know, it just reshaped how we're, I was looking at the whole film. It, it became like uh, an aha moment. So I just want to share that, that how, you know, going back to that original question on the writing of the, of our uh, film, that became a major uh, uh, revelation. So right. and just wanted to mention the, uh, uh, the other people that have been very, very instrumental. There actually have been many, you know, uh, but those two were like Suzanne, you know, when you have one editor for like 10 years, of course there was Jan Wenner and others, but mm. the one person that's just day to day managing the, you know, uh, writers as well as writing his own cover stories then that that's he's he's helping to um, uh, affect American culture. Period. So mm. I just wanted to share that little bit of insight. On no, that's it. That's that's important to mention. And 
it's interesting. All all three of your subjects have have had enormous impacts on on contemporary society from the 19th century and leverage right up through through Ben Fonkworth. There was a question, and I and, and Mark, you you uh, noticed it, and it came from an audience member about process and editing. Um, was there anything else you all wanted to add, just to to uh, to reflect on that person's question, which was, what was the writing process like, and did the editor participate? Uh, we've pretty much answered that, I think. But but is there anything you want to add? No, <laughs> which is perfectly all right. I'm um, the editor, so I participated. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. But I did have a co-writer, Mark Monroe. With right, him, so, uh, right. Um, what? How important? We, we've also alluded to this a little bit. How how important is mentorship uh, for all of you? I mean, who were the people who have uh, influenced you in terms of starting this as a career and and why you started it as a career? Have you have you had people who were enormously impactful on your on your own work? For me, definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. Being a first-time filmmaker, of course, I've been in media, television, broadcasting, and even short films, you know, my entire life. But mm -hmm. a feature length that's completely different is very, very different, very complex. And so very, very lucky, Frida Lee Mock, Doug Blush, and so many others. Um, uh, I feel like every day I'm coming from ground zero because I'm just trying to learn so much from these people who have done, you know, hundreds of films. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference with the, the experts who have done somebody who's done one. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend uh, mentorship, mentorship, mentorship. In fact, we're doing that. We're shadowing uh, young people uh, um, who have been helping us also. So they also can have uh, that experience that I'm having. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you one example. Uh, one of the first fellowships uh, from uh, National Association of Latino Independent Producers, an amazing world-class operation. Um, I walk in on this fellowship and I'm sitting next to uh, somebody, a, a great a producer with American Masters. And the other side is somebody from another great, uh, uh, you know, uh, filmmaking, organization. So the one thing I did learn, and I, I, I always puzzled, puzzled why, she said, you have to start with spreadsheets. You cannot do a documentary without a spreadsheet. And I totally understand now, because <laughs> we would have the script, and then the visuals and the audio and all of that. And had we not started that way, I don't know how we could have, you know, been able to move. So um, I would say quickly, actually, uh, mm. or making quick decisions. So I just wanted to share that one little bit of advice from uh, advice from me from from uh, the American Masters producer. Right. <laughs> so. Well, listen, I you know this time has just flown by. I hate to say it, but we've got to we're moving on to the second panel. But you all have been wonderful, and your insights have been incredibly useful, and I think interesting. And I want to thank the three of you. And and. Uh, can't wait to see the films and good luck on the 20th when the awards are, are presented and, and uh, God bless all three of you. You're doing wonderful work. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and, uh, American Masters producers, Prudence Glass, just wanted to ah. mention. And I just want to say congrats <laughs> to the other two and to all the other folks nominated as well. Can't wait to see your films. Congratulations yep. to everyone. Exactly. Me okay. too. Okay, so uh, we are going to if uh, Dana and Nancy and Molly are on board here, we're going to uh, switch over to the second group. And I am just going to briefly
Stay with us, folks. We will get started with our television and streaming nominees in just a few seconds. Once again, we're just switching our panelists um, to our streaming and television documentary screenplay nominees. Um, so we will be starting, and here's Michael. Now I'm unmuted. Okay. Uh, welcome back, everybody. We just finished a, a really great conversation, and we are about to have another one with some more of the nominees for documentary script writing excellence in this year's Writers Guild Awards, which will be on March 20th, a week from this coming Sunday. Uh, so let me introduce everyone. Uh, Rob Imbriano is nominated for Citizen, which is an episode of the miniseries Amend the Fight for America on Netflix. Uh, Marcella Gaviria is involved with the frontline documentary The Jihadist, which I'm very interested to, to talk about among all the other films. Jeff Ward, uh, a friend and, and colleague of many years who is nominated for a writer episode of the PBS series Hemingway. Uh, Gene Tempest uh, for Citizen Hearst. <laughs> First, the part, part one of that for the American experience and Sarah Burns uh, for round one, which is the opening episode of the series Muhammad Ali. So welcome to all of you. And again, congratulations and I want to start with you all, as I did with uh, the first group, basically asking you to talk a little bit about, because not everyone's had a chance yet to see all of your films, if you could talk a little bit about the subject matter, uh, the who and the what and the why, and what your motivation is for telling this particular story. So um, who'd like to start? Sarah? Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so our film, this, this, this is one episode of a four-part series uh, on the life of Muhammad Ali. It's really a birth-to-death biography. There have been lots of things out there about Ali before, and I think that was one question we asked ourselves getting started, was what mm. can we, you know, is there, is there something new we can bring to this? But it felt like no one had ever pulled all these different threads of Ali's life together into one story. Um, the fights, yes, of course, um, but also his political views, his religion, his family life, um, what he does after his boxing career is over and sort of getting all of these things uh, together and understanding them as connected and, and as sort of threads in one larger story about his life. Um, and just one of the most compelling figures I think we've ever had um, and the chance to understand him in his context um, in this important period in in the 20th century that he's living through and impacting himself so um, it was really a joy to work on um, and we we thought it was going to be three parts and we got to the end of writing three episodes myself and my writing partner david mcmahon and we uh he hadn't even fought george foreman yet like i guess it's going to be four wow. <laughs> so. yeah. rogue uh, so Amend uh, is about the 14th Amendment, uh, and the 14th Amendment is about uh, the struggle for equality in America. It's a six-part uh, series um, that starts with uh, Black struggle and then moves over to uh, the fight that women uh, have had using the 14th Amendment uh and their fight to get into the mainstream and then uh the lgbtq community and then finally immigrants um it is probably the most powerful vehicle in the constitution that no one really knows about i didn't know about it uh and as a black irish italian baptist catholic jew uh it is the, the one thing that threads all of my stories together 
Uh, and it was an opportunity to take uh, everyone's story out of its silo and put it into one uh, coherent group uh, and tell a story about equality in America. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would. I, one of the things I, I want to talk about is the fact that how much for all of us, all documentary writers, how much of the process is discovery that you even a, even a subject that you think you know uh that you learn just incredible amounts it's a it's a you're creating a learning experience for your audience but it's also a tremendous learning experience for yourself and you know the scale of this story was something that we actually tried to match in terms of our presentation so we were very fortunate to get will smith on board uh because there's not really a big market for a six-part series on the 14th amendment uh, mm -hmm. There's a rather large market for a six part series starring Will Smith. Uh, we had Mahershala Ali and Samuel L. Jackson and Diane Lane and a, a number of amazing actors who really brought uh, their best uh, to the performances that we asked them to do. But then on the other side, driving the story, and as far as storytelling is concerned, we had Sherilyn Eiffel and Brian Stevenson and Kimberly Crenshaw and uh, David Blight and Emily Bazelon, just an incredible group of people. So uh, we really tried to get in the room a representation of America, as much of a representation as we possibly could. And you also, in another production capacity, you had Larry Wilmore. Yes. Involved Larry, in this. And, Larry uh, was very involved in it, yep. And our, and, our, uh, and our friend and associate, Sasha, Sasha Stewart. So yes. uh, some really major major talent. Uh, Marcella, what about the jihadist? Well, um, our film was about the story, the life and times of Abu Muhammad al-Jalani. Um, and as I'd like to point out, it's the story of the most important jihadist of the last 20 years that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, the man that um, basically inherited the jihad from Osama bin Laden, who uh, was uh, a key member of Al Qaeda that took over Syria, uh, Syria's fight against Assad. And so we had a remarkable opportunity to interview this uh, man, Abu Muhammad al Jalani. I will. Um, tell you that um, I did not go to Idlib in the process of making this film because as a woman, uh, part of the team, one of the conditions was that, well, women aren't allowed to travel to Idlib to interview Abu Muhammad al Jalani. But I did um, get to know him quite well through maybe a 450 page transcript in Arabic that where he recounts his life. And the amazing thing about making a film about somebody that um, nobody's ever heard of in Arabic is is truly how 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 in, how fascinating his life is and how it intersected with so many key moments in the wars of Iraq and Syria. And so it was a, a chance to tell this narrative from a completely different perspective. For the first time, a man that had never spoken to the West uh, sat down with Martin Smith, my correspondent and co-writer, and, and uh, revealed the secrets of what it was like to be in the jihad and to be... Um, Baghdadi's worst enemy and all these, um, you know, really in-depth um, moments that that were quite revealing and stark. So it was it was a great experience. And how did and how did you and and Martin um, gain access to him? That must have been quite something. Uh, <laughs> well, when you cover the region enough, um, you know, I suppose people start realizing that uh, you have some expertise in it. And um, Martin has so many contacts in Syria because he's covered it for so long. Mm -hmm. And he actually kind of got an email out of the blue that said, 
uh, would you like to speak to Abu Muhammad Al Jalani? And he was like, absolutely. But then it was how to convince Frontline and PBS to make a film about somebody that nobody's ever heard of. And it also strikes me another, you know, among the other differences in, in the various films that are nominated, you, you have films like Muhammad Ali and, and uh, uh, that uh, take a large amount of time of research to write, to produce, um, whereas your project really had to be done in a very quick time frame. And you really well, sort of had to, you know, that that's what happens when you cover uh, current affairs, and, mm -hmm. and often uh, these films sort of land on your lap. And we thought it might be a twenty-minute film because they weren't quite sure they wanted to to make this. But but the story was so fascinating and so intimate, and to be able to have access to something that nobody else had we really pushed for it to become an hour. But but the challenges really were, you know, when the central protagonist is a man that speaks in Arabic and how to sort of keep the audience engaged in that amount of time, uh, you know, I, I think we, we struggled some in sort of trying to figure out how to let him speak for himself, but how not to be used by him. Right. Because, um, you know, here we're giving the platform to um, someone that is reviled, hated, has a $10 million um, you, a reward on his head. And yet we're giving him a microphone to speak to the world. And so that was a really delicate balance in writing the script. And I mm. think um, what it, it was quite a challenge, especially in the last moments when executive editors and the team at Frontline who were so diligent about getting things right, wanted to make sure we didn't have sort of Stockholm syndrome by having interviewed this man. Right. And he turned out to be really quite impressive and restrained in the way he explained his point of view. And we realized that he was to some extent, obviously using us. He wants to rebrand himself. He wants to speak to the rest of the world. And we have been the vehicle that he has chosen for that message. So it's, it was tricky, but um, I'm pleased with how it turned out. <laughs> Jeff, Ernest Hemingway. Yeah, um, you spoke about uh, people, uh, getting to know people when you do this. And uh, I, I was very keen to do this because uh, he fast, has always fascinated me, but you do learn the longer you spend with the people like this, you learn stuff that you never knew. And, uh, you know, he's, the, he's probably after Mark Twain, the most important American writer, at least I would make that argument. I think everybody here writes differently than they would have had they, and had he not done his work. Um, uh, you know, the hatred of, of um, adverbs uh, comes from him. <laughs> And uh, I, I found him absolutely compelling uh, and, not, and not at all the caricature of himself that he presented as the years went by. And in this first show, I think he's terribly winning. Uh, he's a, he's a compli you know, complicated Middle Western product who just decides after World War I that he's going to be a great writer. And he sets out to do that, and he is one. And uh, we try to set up all the complications of his childhood, his, his uh, uh, formidable mother, and his very sad father. And I think the thing I learned most, and that made me, in some ways, it's a terribly tragic life, which ends with his killing himself. He thought of killing himself starting at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. He made it to 63 and wrote some of the great stories and a couple of very, very fine novels in all of American literature. I think that's a triumph in a way. And I, I so I find him um, at once repellent. He's, he's awful a lot of the time. 
but he is, um, and he's terribly tortured and he, he does a lot of it to himself, but it's all of it is trying to deal with a terrible cloud of depression that can catch him at any moment. And I, for that reason, I found it terribly compelling to write. And mm -hmm. the other challenge was if you're writing narration and there's a lot of narration in that series, so is Ernest Hemingway. And uh, writing, uh, you know, you, you're not contending with him. He wants to contend with everybody. I don't want to do that. I want to just tell his story. But still, you do find yourself, at least I'll find myself, uh, you know, dumping adverbs that I might have put in before. And it right. Made you very clean when you wrote. Very <laughs> well, that's interesting because, because, Jeff, you've written books and many articles. Uh, how is it different when you sit down to uh, write a narrative for something like coming up? No topic sentences. <laughs> 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 Pictures of the topic sentence. Um, it's not that different. I mean, I read a whole, I mean, you know, I'm surrounded by the American Revolution at the moment. And the Holocaust books are over there on the floor because we finished the show on that. Um, I just do a lot of reading and, and uh, it's the same thing. You just can't do as much of it. And I've had the great good fortune of, of writing a number of books which are loosely based on the show, mm -hmm. but which allow me to use all the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor. Plus, right. mm -hmm. and, uh, the on only once did I ever write one of those that is very different from the film, and that was the Jack Johnson biography, because I was so dazzled and fascinated by him. Ah. He's one of the great figures in American history, I think. It's for another evening, but... Yeah. Well, the one time I wrote a companion book to a series, I found that they both informed each other, that not only did the, the TV scripts inform... The book informed the TV scripts, and the TV scripts informed the, yeah. the book. And by the time I started doing the, the rewrites, again, that cycle repeated itself. You know? Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, Jean, sorry to make you wait. No, um, not, not at all. I mean, uh, no, no worse nightmare really for a young writer than following Jeff Ward, but I will take <laughs> on this challenge. I know the, I know the feeling. Um, and, uh, and talk a little bit about our film, you know, and Hearst, I think, would, would very much hate that I think he's, he's probably the only person on this panel who does need an introduction um, because he thought of himself as such a... A, a huge showman and in so many ways he was. And what we got the opportunity to do with Citizen Hearst was over four hours, um, you know, look, uh, look at this guy's life and at his times. And he's a media mogul, he is part showman. And um, what we do in the first episode, the first two hours, which I wrote is, um, you know, look at how he builds it. So it's kind of the story of young Hearst um, and, and the beginnings. And I think what's attractive to it from my standpoint, you know, is, is the, the fact that it allowed us to really immerse ourselves in this totally foreign world. You know, like this is about newspapers in a way that, you know, we can only dream about them today. You, we're, we're talking about a culture that's built on them and, and you can almost sort of smell the ink off of, uh, you know, off of some of this footage. And it was really exciting especially because I felt like, you know, the newspaper kind of died when I was in college and, and in some cases it's doing better now, but to go back to this time and to look at what it was when it was at the Apogee was a real opportunity. And then to place this guy in that context and figure out how he played with it and how he built a media empire was an awesome challenge and, uh, and really a, a ton of fun. Mm. This might seem like a slightly off filter question, but how do you all feel, this is something that has changed a great deal over the last 10, 20 years in documentaries, um, feel about uh, recreation. Uh, in some cases, it's just as in the, say, the Ken Burns films that, uh, that Sarah and, and, and uh, Jeff have worked on, where you have people reading the words of, of significant characters in the story, but in other cases, it's actual attempts to create some impression of what events were like. Um, is that valid, do you think? Or are there, are there problems with that? 
I just have trouble with it. I, sometimes yeah. it's done wonderfully, but I never believe, I, I am taken out of it because I don't believe that a person in an extremely nicely dry cleaned 19th century suit uh, standing next to a pillar with flowers is really that person at all. And so mm -hmm. it, 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 sets me, it sets me back. Uh, we, I'm, uh, we are launched on the American Revolution. Good luck to us. Um, we'll mm -hmm. see. We, mm -hmm. I, we don't know how we're going to do it. We'll see. Right, right. Rob, uh, you've used some stage techniques in, in, in the, the Amen series, right? We, we absolutely did, but um, I, I make a distinction between what we did and recreations. It was mm -hmm. really important uh, for us to achieve two things. One, we had to create a device uh, that carried uh, over 150 years of storytelling. So having someone pretend they were Frederick Douglass in, you know, Frederick Douglass uh, clothing, rolling, you know, his R's, that, that, that would have been nonsense mm -hmm. uh, and would not have held up by the time we got to 2015. Um, and so it was really important, too, because so much of this really hinged on the words as we were mm -hmm. doing the research and we researched for five years. I learned so many things and came across so many incredible uh, pieces of writing, either from uh, speeches, books, newspapers, magazines, FBI wiretaps. It was, it was really important for those ideas to land in a way that was as fresh as possible. And so we really wanted people to show up and to perform these words, but in contemporary clothing, directly to camera, make it intimate, uh, so that the words felt fresh today, uh, and mm -hmm. as fresh today as they did 150 years ago. So I don't consider what we did recreations. In fact, mm -hmm. I, I blanch at the idea, but, uh, but right. I think performance was actually really important. My, my response is, my, my feeling has always been that if you feel absolutely compelled to do it, that it has to be done in such an impressionistic way that it doesn't um, that it doesn't create any kind of false re false or chintzy uh, attempt at recreating something um, what about um, well I, I did want to ask you all because I think people like to know um, how you got started in writing documentaries that you may have been in other aspects of the documentary world. Um, Jeff, I know for you, I, th I think it started when you, uh, I think, did you, weren't you writing a piece about the Shakers film that Ken did or something? Or? I, I, I'll do it very quickly. I, yeah. got, I got canned from my job. At, uh -huh. I, was, I was editor of American Heritage. Right. Uh, uh, Ken needed somebody uh, for an NEH grant, needed mm -hmm. one more warm body to look at a film he was working on. Somebody said, I had nothing to do, <laughs> and send him. And I went up and, uh, and saw the Shaker film, which is a wonderful film. And I uh, made several suggestions, none of which were adopted, establishing a system which has continued now for 40 odd years. <laughs> and and uh, he asked me if I wanted to write Huey Long. And I didn't know enough to say no, and I didn't have anything else to do. So I wrote a script really long, and the film got into the New York Film Festival. And I was so naive that I thought all films, you know, it was made in the, it was made by, uh, it was written by somebody in New York. Probably, of course, it was in the New York Film Festival. <laughs> you, know, I was, you know, it's taken me a while to understand what I was doing. Right, right. <laughs> Rob, what about you? I come from news uh, uh -huh. and right. it, it took me a while. I, I, I think, you know, for me, um, I started to do work with Peter Jennings and long form at news uh, mm -hmm. and then um, followed uh, him and Tom Yellen into the documentary group uh, and started doing long form there. Uh, mm -hmm. I still go back to news uh, every now and then. Um, but I'm, I'm more a second draft person, not a first draft. I, I, I like the analysis that comes with it and the distance that you can, you can take advantage of if, uh, 
if you have the opportunity. So, mm -hmm. and, and and Sarah and Jean. Um, I so I I for me, documentary filmmaking is the family business. I've known right. Jeff for basically my entire life. Um, Literally, your entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, my entire life. It's true. Um, for me, though, I, I sort of came to it because I had a story I was passionate about. I um, actually wrote my undergraduate thesis about the wrongful convictions in the Central Park Five case. Mm -hmm. And that became a book. And once I started working on that, it just felt like a story that that needed to be told. And so uh, I started making films because that was a story that I felt really passionately about. And so um, and then I got hooked. And so that's what I've been doing ever since then. Right. Jean. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's kind of a happy accident, really. Like I, I come from from history, um, from that side of it. So the, you know, writing historical docs makes a lot of sense. And then mm -hmm. sort of bamboozled or wedged my way in a door and, you know, started with the research side and, and um, and worked up from there. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's such a cool discovery wow. that you can actually take something totally off of print and and then what an honor to have somebody actually read it and, you know, to kind of write almost like music. Like it's such a cool thing. I hope that the secret doesn't totally get out, but but right. it's great. You know, all of you watching, it's fantastic. Like obviously we, we love it. So but um, but no, I mean, there's still the appeal, I think, both of new research and, and new ways of telling the story mm -hmm. and, and such a cool time to be working, I think, uh, you know, with narration right now in history and to be thinking really hard about what we can do with that and how we can tweak these forms as everything's transforming. So it's a it's a lot of fun. And then we can sneak original research in, which is also great. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of a. It's not all, I think it's a, it's important to remember that it's a service job too. Like we serve the story, we serve the editors, like, and um, so there's no ego to it, but there is a lot of joy, I think. You're the first, you're the first um, resident historian at American Experience, is that right? That's right. Yeah, I was for a, a year. I worked uh, uh -huh. this, uh, at WGBH, which was an um, unusual, unusual position on a TV show. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, we should say for for people who don't know American Experience, they've been around for a little bit more than thirty years, and they're kind of, um, I mean, I'm sure uh, Sarah and, and Jeff, you'll spiritedly disagree, but they, you know, like they like to talk about themselves as a flagship on PBS for for I, Yeah, I wrote four or five shows for them, yep. so I know those folks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was and I was consulting on a couple, so yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, but yeah, so they do they do a lot of history, and and yes. uh, and they let me in um to to be a part of that there but um but it's somewhat more fun i think to be out with the film teams um mm -hmm. actually working on these things martella we were talking i don't know if you heard the conversation we were just talking about how people got started in the, the documentary writing aspect of, of tv uh ha had you been a part of my last 10 minutes it would have made a great sitcom <laughs> oh no <laughs> Well, we, we can talk to people. We know people. Lack of electricity and a husband in underwear. Pa anyway, it was hilarious. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I got my start making films thanks to uh, a coup I had in Colombia interviewing the, uh, the, the infamous family of Pablo Escobar. And, and it's been a wild ride ever since. But um, when when I got a shot at working with Rain Media, where I've been for the last 20 years with uh, my co-writer and correspondent and now husband, uh, Martin Smith, he said something that I thought was so true. He said, you know, writing uh, a, a document or making a documentary is like writing a book with a 500 pound pen. And... It, it has been so true because it takes so much muscle to get everything done. And, and whatever a writer in the New York Times can so eloquently say in four seconds, it takes so much more machinery to get the same message across. 
and and it takes uh, cameramen and flak jackets and um, you know accidental death and dismemberment insurance and and just you know the layers of complexity to getting these films on the screen or on TV is enormous. I am a firm believer in the notion that chance favors the prepared mind. Um, and that if this is Nothing something like a you, pastel quote, just to <laughs> lighten up the evening, not bad. That's like, hey, you know, <laughs> I thought it was Arnold Palmer. Oh, okay. Um, that, you, uh, that you get your foot in the door wherever you can get your foot in the door. Because that has been my experience and the experience of a lot of other people. That you, so that you're there when the moment comes. Well, well, I'll give you the story of how I got my foot in the door. And if anybody's listening, I wish I heard this more often. Um, I, I called up somebody in London who was making the film about Pablo Escobar. And they said, um, you know, you kid, you have no experience. I can't hire you. And then uh, I said, but will you give me four days to prove to you that I'm the person you should hire? And that began my 20 year journey at Frontline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's amazing. That That's is so amazing. Cool. That is amazing. What, I mean, all of you are experienced and um, in the time you've been working in, in this field, how, how has the process changed? What are the, what are the new technologies for good or ill and, and how have they uh, changed your way of telling stories? I don't think it's changed mine. I was mm -hmm. saw that on the, you know, sort of dummy question, and I, I have no answer for that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm st we're still making the same stuff we were, we made. We you know mm -hmm. we change things, uh, and you know when it, when I started it was people holding up strips of film, and now it's done in front of you on a machine. That's different, but I don't think it's changed any. We we. We still believe in the attention span. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if it's a good story and it's well told, people stay with it. And I, uh, I, I hate the, you know, the notion of nobody will be interested in this and, and so on. And I, I, I pay tribute, to, uh, I've done this before, but I pay tribute to Ken because I have worked with some people, even uh, American experience people long ago, none of them now involved who were filmmakers who had to be persuaded that history was interesting. Mm. As, as soon as they have a story, then they go back to high school in their head and they say, God, I have to know which month that happened in and all mm. of that. And Ken, as I have never had in 40, whatever it is, years, a conversation where I said, I promise you this is interesting. He always agrees that it's interesting. And he has he also has a sense that it's complicated and that's mm -hmm. that's what i love most because mm -hmm. so much stuff not any of it by anybody here god knows but there are people who simplify these stories and you know it fits in with commercials and it's over and it's uh bouncy and cheerful and it doesn't have much to do with what really happened mm -hmm. so, it's I still like the story it. it's still it's still the story yeah it's the story the story rules no matter how how it's uh, how it's conveyed to the public through whatever technology it's conveyed. It's still about the story. And, and in our case, we've done a lot of famous people. Mm -hmm. They are all complicated. <laughs> and <laughs> the way to do that is to convey that. Um, mm -hmm. Muhammad is certainly complicated in that show. Right. Henry right. Is, you know, I mean, it's, it's um, and Hearst is complicated. It's yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that. <laughs> no, totally. I mean, that's what, you know, it's, it's the, uh, the telling detail. It's the, uh, I think it's the... so interesting because it's not that I, it's not that I disagree that it hasn't changed. And I think we're all working in this mm -hmm. world that, that you and Ken created, you know, to a certain extent, if you're an historical doc, there's no question, you know, you made this in America and then, um, you know, this is, it remains your form to, to, a, to a great and, um, and, and really real extent. At the same time, I do think it's changing. I think that it's very clear that what America looks to history for is changing. The idea of a narrator 
as the voice of God is changing. And, you know, I'm not of the school that thinks that we can't have narrators anymore, but I think that there are new ways to play with that voice, to force mm -hmm. the audience to think about, you know, it's not just the heads on camera that have perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and we're certainly making choices when we write. So I do think, I don't think it's about the R. I do love the form and mm -hmm. I do believe in the narrator, but I think it really is changing right now. And such a, um, you know, politically, interesting time to be writing for history. There's mm -hmm. no question. Yeah. You know, it's not the same American history we've had. No, you know, in, in this world, I just feel like our job is to slow people down mm. so that they stop sort of looking at Twitter and just kind of be able to focus on something for an hour or two and learn. Yep. I, mean, I, I was, I, I, mean, I was that, go ahead, Ruth. Well, we, we would say constantly on, on you know, the set of Amend, it's, it's not that the past is present, it's that the past is always present. Mm -hmm. And if you make those parallels and those connections strong enough, you, you really see how we are where we are. And, and the telling, and, and one thing that I appreciate about this panel in particular, is the dedication to telling America's fuller story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are right. now in a place where that also has commercial traction, uh, which is something that has been relatively new. Uh, and our opportunities to tell that story and expand it uh, are much greater than they've ever been. Mm -hmm. I also think that inevitably what we do, even when we're telling historical stories that are really far removed from our present moment, are always informed by our present moment and that inevitably there are those ways that right. those connections arise that if we'd made the same film 10 years ago or 20 years ago it would be different inevitably and i think that's really important that like as much as we're telling a story that is set in the past it is very much also a product of the moment in which it's being made and so i think in that sense it's it's of course it's changing because it's always reflecting who we are right now and where we are, even if it ostensibly has nothing to do with the present moment. Right, well, and I think, six go ahead. Years to make amends, Michael, and the place where we Michael. started, the place where we finished, it, it was, we were in a totally different universe. Yeah. <laughs> Completely. Yeah. Jack? Michael, you asked about mentors um, earlier. And I yes. Don't, I don't really have them any in this field necessarily. I mean, you know, I've worked with Ken for a long time, but, uh, I did have a mentor, Arthur Slazer was a, was a mentor of mine I, I, when I was writing about Roosevelt. And mm -hmm. um, he used to say history is an endless argument. And it is. Um, the, if, if I were, I, I speak only for myself, if I were doing the Civil War again, I have things I would have done differently. Mm -hmm. And whoever does it next will do it differently. Mm -hmm. and there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, nothing is ever definitive. Ever, 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 and if you if you pretend it is, you're in trouble. Yeah. Oh, well, I was, the great I was just, historian yeah. Mark Block says that you know if you expect everything to be redone every ten years, and it should be absolutely, it yeah. needs to be. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking about this in, in terms of race in America, obviously, and then uh, Jeff, you and I have worked on several different projects about uh, the American West, and yeah. the history of the American West, and. And that's gone through a, a, an enormous revision over the years and a reevaluation. I, th I think that's a really good point. Yeah. I have a question almost sort of along those lines, which from, from one of our audience members, which is what is the best piece of writing advice you've received or would give? I'll answer that. Please. Good. <laughs> Restraint. <laughs> I, I think. I think it's restraint. It's like not overtelling. You're you're trying to hold suspense and make sure that you don't overtell and you want to lead into the next soundbite, but just hold back. That's good advice. Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll give a shout out to one of my heroes. So Michelle Ferrari once told me to think of. Uh, you know, to think of narration as a second score. You know, that's that's mm -hmm. one of our great privileges. We're not writing just for the page. So uh, mm -hmm. to think of it that way. Beautiful. 
I was going to say before we were talking about American experience and, and I was working on a, a film, not for American experience, but another series at WGBH and, and uh, Judy Crichton, who was the first executive producer of American experience came in to take a look and give advice. And she was very fond of a Barbara Tuckman essay that you all probably know called history by the ants. Uh, and she was like, find the telling object or moment or incident that basically tells your story in just a few words. And uh, for the film I was working on that worked that worked terrifically. Um, but that was, you know, mine. I, I want to second the notion of restraint. Um, yeah. uh, what, uh, the other thing that throws me out of films is when someone says, for no, for no reason except that they're worried that I won't be excited, it was the biggest building, it was the biggest river, it was, you know, it has nothing to do with the story. It has to do with being frightened that you'll look away. And after a while, you can't hear that stuff anymore. The, the, fifth, the fifth biggest. Mm -hmm. if you, if yeah. You do a test, no one would pass that test. Yeah. No, I wrote a TV series for the Smithsonian with David McCullough for a couple of years. And the people at the Smithsonian were always like, this is the biggest steam engine with a piston that goes back into the vid. It makes you crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, all of you have been wonderful. We've run out of time. Um, you've just been terrific. And I think enormously, not only entertaining and inform informative, but I think instructive to everyone tuning in. Um, the awards are a week from Sunday, March 20th, and uh, we wish you all the best. And uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight and participating in this. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, it's a joy Thanks a lot. Thank you. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yes, to all of you. And, and great good luck. Not just Sunday night, but and beyond. So, <laughs> thank you all. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening.